That's me. And a bona fide stunt. That's Jeff. And you can't teach that. Ladies and gentlemen. E. T. A. Easy aggravation, but I'm Shane. I'm here with Jeff, and today we'll be talking about WWE's competitor NJPW's version of WrestleMania this year, Wrestle Kingdom 10. And uh, there's a lot of it going on too. But I, would they be considered the only competitor or the only main competitor? I know they're the second largest in the world, but uh, are, at this point, is there even competition in WWE in the states? Uh, probably not. I guess. I guess what I could have said is. WWE's counterpart in Japan, NJPW. Uh, although I'm pretty excited that former WWE announcer Jim Ross is now going to be the in, the voice of NJPW, at least in the United States, starting on March 4th, which happens to be my my 41st birthday. Well, um, happy birthday, I think. Wait. Yes, yeah, a nice present, I think. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, that would be. An, I don't know. I, I I kind of was enjoying Matt Stryker because Matt Stryker did the commentary for this one, uh, along with uh, who was the other guy that he was with on the on the commentary. Oh, that would be Kevin Kelly and uh, Yoshitatsu. Yes, that's right. Yoshitatsu was uh, <laughs> who might have been the driest color man I've ever seen or ever heard. But I thought Matt Stryker did a pretty decent job with this too. Well, I like Matt Stryker a lot, but. He's not Jim Ross. No, nobody's Jim. And Ross. and uh, Stryker's got a full time job as a, the lead announcer for um, Lucha Underground. Lucha Underground, and so you know Ross is basically just taking Manu Moro, Mano Ronaldo's role now that Ronaldo is you know the lead announcer for SmackDown. The NJPW needed a new guy to go with Josh L. Barnett um, on their broadcast on Access TV, and so Jim Ross is filling that role. I don't know what he's going to be doing their pay-per-views necessarily, but he's going to be the guy on the Americanized version of the NJPW show where they kind of show matches um, from their big events during the year. And actually, after a year, they started in like 2013. Well, I shouldn't say they started in 2013. It started last year, um, or maybe it was like right before Wrestle Kingdom 9. I can't remember, but it was, it was only been a little bit over a year that they've been on access television if it's even been a year yet I, like i said i can't remember exactly when it started but they started um broadcasting like taped episodes from 2013 and as of september of last year they were in like may of 2015 so they're actually catching up in quite a hurry so i'm not sure if that means that that they're going to to keep being on that same kind of a slight delay or if they're going to be more like um TNA or ROH where they're maybe only a month behind, you know, going forward. I kind of hope that they they catch up a bit. I'd like to, what I'd like to see is another competitor to WWE. I mean, don't get me wrong, WWE is, is still top dog, and, but they, uh, they're lacking so much competition that I think it's making their own story dry. And, uh, well, the TNA, sad thing about, the sad thing about their, you know, the chance of NAPW competing with them is that they just lost their best tag team and the possibly the two best wrestlers in the world to WWE right now. Yeah, and, and but they've proven in the past that they can build people. I mean, right before AJ Styles went there and became the best, one of the best in the world, uh, Prince Devitt was there as one of the best in the world. So they, I mean, they're they're good at really recycling talent. And the uh, the thing that, I mean, if we really want a competitor to the WWE. New Japan Pro Wrestling is probably the best shot we've got. TNA is, um, they had their chance. Uh, if the Jarrett's had still been in charge, I think we'd have a completely different landscape right now. I think if uh, Dixie Carter had never taken over and made the mistake of bringing in Hogan and Bischoff and uh, basically copying everything WWE does, I think had the Jarrett's still been involved in TNA, they would have become easily a competitor to uh to the WWE because they had uniqueness, they had talent. I mean, you and I were talking about it at one time. At one time, on that roster, they had the best wrestler in the world, AJ Styles, and they also had the guy with the most personality in wrestling in Xavier Woods, 
both on that same roster at one time. And it's just because of the way that the, it's managed. It just didn't work. And Ring of Honor, I, I like what's going on in Ring of, Ring of Honor. I like a lot of the wrestlers. I, I mean, Frankie Kazarian and Christopher Daniels have always been my, two of my favorites, even back in their TNA days. But, and and actually, uh, speaking of Christopher Daniels, I love the fact that now that he's now decided that he's no longer a fallen angel because he doesn't follow people and he doesn't and he's not angelic. He's now the Almighty Christopher Daniels. Yeah, that is kind of entertaining. Um, I, I still <laughs> and it, it enabled him to keep the names of like the Angel Wings and stuff like that. But uh, I bring of honor if they're going to continue jumping channels, I, it's in less than a year they're on now their third different channel. That's not a way to build an audience. You're not going to build an audience and, and followers by jumping around every couple of months. I think that's the one thing right now that's going to shoot Ring of Honor in the foot is that kind of uh, that kind of mismanagement. Uh, yeah, possibly. You know, the other thing about you know our, the other guy that he had at one time. Speaking of ROH, is their World Heavyweight Champion, or well, not Heavyweight Champion, but their World Champion Jay Lethal. In fact, Lethal and Xavier Woods were together as a as a unit, and yeah, and and TNA just decided they didn't know what to do. And and you know, I I'm not going to blame them for that necessarily because I didn't see the potential in um, Xavier Woods when he was consequence, consequences Creed. I didn't even see the potential in him when he moved from NXT to WWE. But he certainly has become, like you said, the most entertaining part of the show. He's easily the best personality. I mean, he's probably the closest thing to the rock type charisma we've had since The Rock. And it, it, he's the thing is, as I, I saw a few of his interviews when he was Consequences Creed, where you could see if they'd take the reins off of him, he had potential. Uh, and, and you're right, back then it was 2008, 2009, he probably wasn't ready for the big time like he is now. Um, but. He uh, he did show flashes of the brilliance, and and Jay Lethal, that might be the most underused talent in TNA history. Jay Lethal is you can see what he can do in Ring of Honor. In when he was in TNA, they had him impersonating Macho Man Randy Savage, impersonating Ric Flair. That was his gimmick, and it might have been one of the most criminally underused talents in in TNA history. Yeah, quite possibly, but he's you know he's found success in ROH, and he was the first guy ever there to win, uh, to hold both the TV title and the world title at the same time. He has since, of course, lost the TV title to Roderick Strong, but um, he's you know he's found success there, and he's now calling himself the greatest first generation wrestler of all time, <laughs> or you know at least in the world today, which I think is a pretty awesome way to promote yourself. Yeah, it's but. It. He does have a good gimmick going there, too. And when you bring in some of the other people uh, into that whole stable that they've got, it does have potential. I just wish that they could figure out how to be, um, I can't think of the word, how to be steady in just what they're doing and try to build a fan base other than on the Internet. Well, it would be nice, but, you know, there's really not that much of a territory system anymore since WWE bought them all up. And, it's, you know, it's going to take decades and decades and decades for any of those territories to gain that kind of attraction. So, so I mean, we, we may be looking at a, at a century now before WWE has a serious competitor in the, in the United States. So the best that we have right now, in my opinion, is NJPW. Yeah, and the Wrestle Kingdom 10, you know, they talk about that being WrestleMania, the WrestleMania of New Japan Pro Wrestling, uh, and it lived up to the bill. I mean, this was better than most of the WrestleManias I've seen in the last decade, and I would say it was right up there with probably my favorite wrestle, uh, WrestleMania, which was 30, uh, when Daniel Bryan won the title. Uh, this wait, wait, is that your best, your favorite of the last decade, or your favorite of all time? That's my favorite of the last decade. Okay, I was going to say because if you think that's better than WrestleMania 17, 18, or 19, I think you're out of your mind. Well, exactly, and and even some of the old nostalgia ones like WrestleMania 4 and 5, I thought. Were oh yeah, 4 is awesome. Um, but. Of, of probably the last I don't know, decade, I'd say WrestleMania 31 is the only one that that really, really competes with what we saw at Wrestle Kingdom 10. Well, part of the problem is that WWE just doesn't have enough matches on their sh on their cards. You know, they have a four-hour WrestleMania, but there's only seven matches on there. Whereas, at least New Japan had nine matches on on theirs, and all their matches had a decent length of time. 
to you know actually tell a story. Whereas WWE, had, they spend so much time on entrances and celebrities, and it just seems like the wrestling takes a back seat to the fanfare. And in JPW, that doesn't happen. And that was one of the things I noticed right off the bat that I uh, was going to mention is that it was nice to see NJPW give every single match its due diligence, let these guys go out there and perform and tell a story. And the fact that this was, j what, just a shade under three hours, and we got nine matches in, and then... I should shade under four hours, Is there a shade under four? Okay, I might have looked at... Oh, well, and then if you add that Royal Rumble that were, was in before, the Rumble Battle Royal, whatever that was in before... Um, it was probably a little bit longer, but it was nice to see every match got time to show what it could do. And it, I mean, starting right off with at the at the very beginning with the Young Bucks and and that four way tag team match. Yeah, that was a blast. Um, yeah, I mean, Sidow and Ricochet were a great team. I think they were making their debut as a team in NJ, NJPW at that event. Red, Red, Red Dragon was also on there, and then Rapongi Vice, which is um, the new team with Beretta and uh, Ricky Romero, who, of course, for years was part of the Forever Hooligans with um, with uh, Kozlov. Yeah, and I, Kyle O'Reilly, um, part of Red Dragon with Bobby Fish. Kyle O'Reilly, this guy, kid's going to be a star. He is somebody that has that kind of talent that I think he could be in five or ten years the next AJ Styles. He's just, he's amazing. And then what we got out of Sidal uh, and uh, Ricochet, their tag team, they're calling themselves Aerial Dogfight. What we got out of them was amazing too. I think you were telling me that they have one of the the most beautiful moves ever in that, uh, that double-sided, um, oh, I can't think of it. Well, it's a stereo shooting star press. They tried it against, um, and they, I think they hit it against Red Dragon in the match, but they didn't hit it precisely. Um, they each hit their move, but they didn't hit it perfectly timed like they did the next night. Um, on the January 5th show, they actually hit it in stereo, and it was just like the most beautiful thing I've seen in a, you know, in a tag team setting. I, I still think, you know, the, the best, the best, uh, the most beautiful move I've ever seen in professional wrestling is AJ Styles' springboard uh, flying forearm. But um, but as far as a tag team maneuver, two guys doing a shooting star press at exactly the same time and hitting it is just, you know? Yeah, and, and I did see where they had that, uh, and it looked like it was just a step off. I guess I haven't seen the, the January 5th show yet, but I, the Young Bucks are another tag team. It's hard to, t uh, when you look at the, this kind of card that's on here and the names, that were in TNA at one time. And then also you look at Ring of Honor and see the roster and how many of them were in TNA at one time. And then also, you know, the people that are in uh, NXT and WWE now, all of these guys that were in TNA when Jeff Jarrett and Jerry Jarrett were in charge, uh, to see what kind of talent they had. Again, like I said, at one point they were the number two promotion in the world or in uh, the United States. I think they could easily be competing had they kept the Jarrett's in charge and kept some of this talent. But even still, the Young Bucks end up coming out the winners on this one. And what could have been, I, I don't want to say it was the best match of the night, but I could very well say it might have been the most entertaining match of the night. I think all four teams gave it their all. There was a lot of high spots. There was a lot of um, a lot of good wrestling action, and it just it was a it was a treat to watch that entire match. Well, this is the fourth straight year that I've watched Wrestle Kingdom, um, and you know, either live or within the within the same week of it airing. And this is the fourth straight year that the Young Bucks have left with the uh, with the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Championships for, from that show. And so, so they all, you know, all the opening matches I've seen on that card have been this type of four-way action for the junior heavyweight tag team title, which is actually a cool um, idea in itself. But you know, they open the show with such high energy by having these kind of matches on there. I think it's just fantastic. And you know, there's a lot of people out there that don't like cruiserweight wrestling. There's a lot of people out there that you know don't like the Young Bucks, but. I think they're a lot of fun to watch, and I think that that division is a lot of fun to watch. I mean, not everything has to be serious, hard-hitting. Uh, well, I shouldn't say hard-hitting, but, you know, 
super psychological work all the time. You need to have um, need to have a different variety. I mean, that's that's always in Vincent Mann's whole theory is that you know it's like a three week circus type thing. If you know if you don't like the elephants, maybe you like the clowns over here. If you don't like the clowns, maybe you like the trapeze. You know, and and that's the same kind of thing here. I mean, you could easily say that the young bucks against you know Red Dragon and whoever else. And um, I should say whoever Ricky Romero is teaming with at the time and then whatever the fourth team is they throw in there is always, you know, while it may not be the best match on the card, certainly gets the, gets the card off to a great a great uh, show, gets the crowd going, and it's just a lot of fun to watch. And there's nothing wrong with having a wrestling match that's a lot of fun to watch. And I think you'd mentioned it there, too. It's This is one thing that junior heavyweights... Um, in New Japan Pro Wrestling, a lot like the cruiserweights were in WCW, a lot like the um, uh, X Division is in TNA. You know, it, it well, the X Division is a little bit different, but um, it's all designed to have a part of their card, a part of their promotion, where some of the smaller guys who are quick, who are athletic, who can put on a great match, they can get some spotlight because now they've got a title to sh shoot for. And that's one thing I feel like WWE is really missing the boat on it is because the only thing to shoot for is that WW World Heavyweight Champion and let's face it there's certain people that just statue wise are never going to make it but it, this one here it was a fantastic match everything about it I really really enjoyed um, like I said Kyle O'Reilly is a future star him te teaming with Bobby Fish with Red Dragon is great Rapungi Vice I really I mean I've seen Rocky Romero wrestle before but this is the first time I think I've actually walked away from his match going wow that was just flat out amazing and then um the young bucks have well, well, that, i was just i just want to say that that forever close i think he does is pretty awesome oh yeah where he's kind of you know he, he just kind of runs around the ring clo if, if folks if you haven't seen it basically he runs around the ring with his arms out close lining anything in sight until you know inertia stops him or you know some outside force just stops him from doing it it's pretty an amazing thing to watch yeah and and they um they used, it was another thing that I noticed, and it was all through this card, is they used outside interference and, um, you know, things that weren't a part of the actual wrestling match in such a way that it, it was it was almost like it was perfect timing. As um, Scott Hall's son was the bodyguard with Young Bucks, and, and he came out and was just... Uh, his role in that with uh, everybody out on the floor and him throwing, I can't remember who it was. Was it... Uh, was it Matt Seidel or was it uh, Kyle? I think Ryan? it was. I thought it was actually Romero. He threw over the top. Was it Romero? I, all I know is watching him fall on the other, uh, the other seven people in that match being thrown out by. And uh, you gotta forgive me. I forgot what his name is. Uh, his first name. Cody. Cody Hall. Yeah. I mean, watching him and I've seen people talk about how he is might be the worst second generation wrestler ever. I guess I haven't seen him in an actual match yet. I've only seen him be the bodyguard, but I thought he filled his role perfectly in this too, which just added to the excitement of the match. Yeah, I haven't seen him wrestle a match yet either, and, and he's still pretty young, I, I believe, but he's certainly got the stature, and it looks like he's got the attitude down of his dad, and he's got, you know, he's certainly got the diamond, uh, or the razor's edge, I guess, is, you know, the razor's edge down. And, you know, I mean, just give him some time. I think he's actually going to be quite something at some point. Oh, yeah, he he has charisma and spades, just like his dad did. I, I, and he looks like he looks the part. I th think he might be taller than his dad, too. I mean, he seemed like, I think he, somebody said he was 6'8 or 6'9 or something like that. He's got the body for it. He's got the build for it. He's got the overall look. He's got the charisma. I think he could be with a little more uh, training. I think he could be on his dad's level. Uh, and I think that anybody saying that he's not at this point is just, they just need to give him time. Exactly. And, and you know, let's just hope he doesn't go down the same route with, you know, drugs and alcohol his dad went down because that would be a tragedy. Um, oh, it, tr it truly would, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as far as Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish, I'm, I'm really kind of excited to watch the... Um, the ROH All Star Extravaganza from September of last year that I downloaded last night because Bobby Fish is wrestling Jay Lethal for the inter for the uh, TV title and then later on the show Kyle O'Reilly is wrestling Jay Lethal for the world title as Jay Lethal is pulling double duty as as you know like we talked about a few minutes ago as the double champion in ROH at that time so it's gonna be fun to watch and then you know the Young Bucks are always fun to watch.
Yeah, they are. I, I wish they would do a little bit less of the um, uh, the DX uh, that they do with the crotch chopping and, the, and the too sweet and all that <laughs> stuff. Um, and a little bit, a little bit less super Especially tips. Jeremy, his voice is like a, a really. It's just a horrible shrill. Um, um, there is no Jeremy. It's Nick Jackson oh, and Matt Jackson. You, I didn't see. I'm thinking of uh, back when they were Generation Me. Oh, okay. They, they were. Uh, <laughs> um, Nick was uh, referred to as Jeremy back when they were Generation Me. Uh, and but the, I think they they do a fantastic job. I love the whole cruiserweight um, aspect of it, and they did a great job of kicking the show off with that match, and then. They dropped it down, um, and this is another thing I noticed about uh, about New Japan Pro Wrestling is they didn't do a palate cleanser. Um, usually, when you have a nice big match, you have a palate cleanser. It's they started right after the Young Bucks and got the crowd into it. Then they went to their low match on the totem pole and they worked their way up to that uh, to the main event. And each match was got you more and more pumped up as opposed to having that palate cleanser. But you know. Watching the Briscoe brothers um, and Toro Yono or Toro Yano against Bullet Club, uh, it was a fun match. I think that um, Toro Yano could be one of the most annoying wrestlers I've seen. Um, but the Briscoes are always fun. Bad Luck F Fale is fun, um, you know. And then of course Takahashi and his gimmick could be one of the better ones. And the match itself was actually fairly entertaining but it was definitely a down from the young from the first match of the night you know the briscoe brothers used to annoy me as a tag team i used to think that they were just um annoying because their matches always turned into, into instead of being a tag match and being basically a two-on-two -two war for the last 10 minutes of it but in the last i would say um five years jay and mark briscoe have, have really individualized themselves Jay, of course, is now a two-time ROH World Champion and had outstanding reigns with that championship and just developed himself as a, as a great singles wrestler. Mark, on the other hand, now has become the, practice, the, you know, the master of redneck kung fu and has also individualized himself as well. And I can see the point where he could actually be world champion at some point as well just because he's got such a distinctive style and a distinctive um, personality now. So now that those two are, are back together as a team, it's almost like a totally different team than they were before, and yet they're both they're more mature, they still have the same chemistry, and they're just a lot of fun to watch as a team nowadays, and um, even more so than they were in the past, or I should say, at least more to me than they were in the past. And then, but like I said, Toriano was just ridiculous. So <laughs> it's just kind of weird that they that they left um, as the as the new open weight six man tag team champions. When Jay and Mark, you know, still have their home in ROH. And the the thing about Toro Yano is that he was Santino Morella, and you and I were talking about it earlier this week about the the shame that has uh, happened to Santino Morella, somebody that was as talented as he was to become a comedy character. But that's what Toro Yano is, and to see him in a legitimate match, having the Briscoes, you know, backing him up, it was almost surreal. Um, you know, I did notice he stole the the double thumb point from RVD, and then you know, just it, being a comedy wrestler in that position is not something you would ever see in the states. I I don't know why they chose to do it, uh, especially against a uh, faction as dominant as Bullet Club has been. Uh, it just it didn't make sense to me. Well, it's also a nice contrast though against, uh, you know, with, with Jay as being kind of the more serious brother and Mark as being kind of the goofy uh, redneck kung fu guy. It's, it's, it's kind of a nice blend, I think, to have him with the, with the Briscoes because it's just like three different complementary personalities to each other, but also conflicting at the same time. Um, I don't really like Toru Yanu, but I think as a team it kind of works. Yeah, I mean, I guess I can see that. It, he didn't, he wasn't in the match a whole ton, um, so it, I guess it did work. It was more about the Briscoes against Bad uh, Bullet Club than anything else, which um, that's a feud I'd like to see continue. Um, but it, I don't know, the match did its it did its job. It started the show off a kind of a little breather after the Young Bucks. This is what we talk about as a palate cleanser. 
um, and it, it kicked it off in the right way to show to continue on in the night uh, to the next match, which um, recently I started writing a um, as a freelancer for the Sportster online. Uh, um, specializes Keep plug. in top. Yeah, I'm this, I pulled out my inner Mick Foley. Um, the right here yeah. on blogger.com. I'm doing a, a top ten or top fifteen worst wrestling moves or worst worst wrestling finishers of all time. And Jay Lethal's right now is sitting at number eleven. But after watching this match a second time, I may have to bump it up a little bit further. Uh, Jay Lethal won. And he defended his uh, ROH heavyweight belt against Elgin, and it was a good match. Jay Lethal is it's Elgin. He, uh, oh yeah, I'm sorry, Elgin. Uh, he was he was horribly underused in TNA. I think he's being used to his full potential now in Ring of Honor, and he's a fantastic wrestler. And they put on a great show, but that finisher, oh my god! Well. It, it looks pretty cool. I mean, it's, it's not like it's a terrible move, but at the same time, it's like, it takes so much setup. It's, it's like, it's, you know, it's a, it's a handstand springboard into a diamond cutter, basically. And it just seems like the kind of match, the kind of move that, that when you hit it, it looks beautiful, but when you miss it, it looks like, what the hell are you doing? And that's I know a, you. I know. I know you have problems other than that with it, though. Well, no. I mean, that's mainly it. I mean, if you think about a cutter, and you think about the two people that have made it the most famous, Diamond Dallas Page with the Diamond Cutter and Randy Orton with the RKO, the main thing about the cutter is you can hit it from anywhere. You can do it anywhere. It can come at any time. The way that he set up the lethal injection in his version of the cutter, there's only one spot that can ever be hit. With the opponent laying, uh, you know, just barely getting up from a big move in the middle of the ring, you know, he can't do it anywhere. It can't come at any time. It's just, it's taking one of the greatest finishers of all time and making it one of the worst uh, in one single, one just one single stroke. Um, but the match itself was was fantastic, and and I like the whole um, House of Truth uh, angle that they're going with with Jay Lethal and and. Uh, the whole thing, I thought, worked well, except for the finisher. Well, the thing with Jay Lethal is I can't remember him ever having a finisher that seemed like it would really make a lot of sense. I mean, he has a lethal combination. He used that for a finisher for a while, which is a backbreaker into a, into a um, flatliner, basically. And while that, you know, looks like, you know, while the flatliner for a while was a finisher on its own, the way Lethal does it, it almost doesn't look like it, it could finish somebody off. And then he would use that as a setup move to Halo to the King, which was his Macho Man Randy, Randy Savage elbow drop from the top rope, the problem with doing that was that meant that basically every time that he hit Lethal Combination, it was to set up Hail to the King, and so you wouldn't really see him do Hail to the King without doing the Lethal Combination. And now, of course, he's come up with the Lethal Injection, which, again, while it legitimately would knock somebody for a loop if they, if you know, you got hit with it, it seems to me. Um, like you said, it, it, it kind of takes away the best aspect of a cutter, and at the same time, when he doesn't hit it exactly right, it looks really sloppy and um, Jeff Jarrett-like an execution. <laughs> there we go, Reagan on Jeff Jarrett again. Um, <laughs> uh, well, like, like, you, like you said earlier, he's got a great mind for the business, but I, I still consider him one of the worst professional wrestlers of all time during at least that 2000 to 2005 stretch where it looked like everything he was doing was choreographed. Well, and, and you're still bitter from the whole 2005 run when they reset TNA. Uh, but yeah, he has a fantastic mind for the business and, and I can't say it enough. I can't imagine where TNA would be if they hadn't gotten rid of him. But you're right. The the lethal injection, I think that's his third different variation uh, or third different finisher. He's called lethal injection. He had one that was a backbreaker at one one point, then he had a sit-out power bomb, and now this. Um, it, it's just, it's. Jay Lethal had a sit-out power bomb. Yeah, uh, I can't remember if it was a sit-out power bomb or, or what it was. It was. I, I just, I just can't of... imagine a guy with his a guy his body size having a power bomb that would be effective. That's why I asked. Yeah, and it's that's one of the things. I mean, his finishers ever since the uh, um, uh, lethal combination has not been fantastic, but he has had things that at least were somewhat better than 
what he's doing now. Um, let me see here if I can remember what it was that he did. But it, even still, uh, the match. By remember, do you mean check on Wikipedia? Yep, and that's what I'm looking at right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see here. Uh, he had Lethal Injection 2, which was a springboard DDT. He currently uses, this is his third variation of the Lethal Injection. He had a pump handle sit-out power bomb that he used uh, in Ring of Honor his first time around. Then he had a belly-to-back suplex lifted and dropped into a neck breaker, and that's the one that he used in TNA forever that was the Lethal Combination. And then he also had the, um, now he has a handspring cutter. So, yeah, he did do a sit-out power bomb. I was correct about that, which, when you think about it, how is somebody that size doing a set out power bomb? Um, well, I suppose it works in the cruiserweight reigns where you're always against a guy that you know it's basically the same size as you. But I, and then, and that's you know for better well for truth be told that's what the X division basically was was a cruiserweight division. I mean obviously Samoa Joe was in there for a while. I think Abyss might have been the X division champion one time. I know Kurt Angle was, but you know I mean for more or less it's always been really a cruiserweight division. So it does make sense he would have that against guys that are always more his size, but in ROH, it isn't the case. You know, as the ROH TV champion and world champion, he's against guys that, while a lot of them are more average size, they're also guys that are, you know, bigger and stronger than him. So having something like the lethal con- lethal injection where you can hit on anybody makes sense, but I think a springboard DDT would be even better than that, personally. He's had many moves. I'd rather see him go back to the elbow drop uh to be honest. Well he, still, well, he still uses it. He just, it just isn't a finisher anymore. I'd rather see him just get rid of this whole springboard thing and go back to the elbow drop as his finisher. And, and and believe me, the elbow drop in today's wrestling doesn't make sense. Um, but I would still rather see that than what we're seeing out of him currently. But uh, we <laughs> moving on to uh, what, match number four of the night, Koshida versus Kenny Omega. And you and I talked about this on a previous episode about Kenny Omega and the year he had, how he could have he could have been in the conversation for wrestler of the year and i'm glad he didn't come out with this whole sweeping the uh, sidewalk entrance because that one just kind of for some reason kind of annoys me um but he got out there they put on a fantastic match um it to have kenny omega lose i don't know if it was them setting him up for bigger things or if uh, where that story is going to go but it I, I don't. I don't know that Kenny Omega losing at that point, especially when what happened the next night was pr- the right idea. Well, I think it was just because they wanted to push him up to a higher level. However, their plans kind of got thrown out the window when um, when Nakamura used his option of leaving the company at the end of the month, at the end of January, to. Um, basically they ended up having him vacate the Intercontinental title instead of having him drop the Intercontinental title to Kenny Omega as was their plan after this event. So it would make sense that he would, you know, get beaten by by Kashida, decide he didn't want to get that title back because he wanted to move up in the world, and then go after the Intercontinental title in in what I I think would have been a series of classics against Nakamura. But when Shinsuke decided to leave the company, that kind of left a hole there, and now who knows... uh, Omega is now wrestling somebody, I believe, on the 12th for the vacant Intercontinental title, and it's and it's not even even anybody that's been announced yet. It's a surprise uh, entrance. So I would not be surprised, I guess, if it was former Intercontinental Champion um, Hiroshi Tanahashi that is challenging Kenny Omega for that vacant title. That would I think make a great match. But if it's not him, then I'm not exactly sure who they could make it be a big enough match now to put Omega over as the Intercontinental Champion and maybe he's going to have to wait a little bit of time now to get that championship I, his, the next night he had that promo um, that he cut talking about how he was done with the juniors he's moving up to the well not just time. a promo I mean, well, he, he also unseated AJ Styles as the leader of Bullet Club he got the rest of Bullet Club to turn on AJ Styles he had AJ with the one wicked angel which is a fucking fantastic finishing move oh yeah and, and then and then and then you know he obviously um further cemented his alliance with the young bucks um as basically you know his his uh go-to right hand men so i mean it was a big it was a complete switch over the next night as far as you know what's dominating the bullet club and possibly new japan for the next year 
And, and I think if anybody could fill in, uh, AJ Styles did a, an amazing job after Prince Devitt left, and I think Kenny Omega might be the right choice to fill in after AJ Styles because I thought Kenny Omega had an amazing year last year this match itself i i would say it was about a four star match i maybe three three and three quarters it it had a yeah lot yeah of, you, know, you and i talked when we first when you first watched this match that it was match of the year for about an hour yeah exactly <laughs> i mean it was it was a great match right up until um you know shibata and the neverweights came out uh but i mean i don't know if it was when i went back and i watched it a second time i don't know if it was as great as what i initially saw uh, um which is probably why it's a good thing i go back and watch it but it i mean it, the match itself told an amazing storyline they had plenty of time to work um kenny omega losing the way he did uh really did set it up to where it could go any way after that match because we didn't know what he was going to do on on the next night uh, on january 5th i mean they set it up where this could be a continuating feud or he could just go another way and he chose to go another way and i i, I hope it works out for him i hope he doesn't uh, flame out i think he might be the next best uh, best in line to take over bullet club after aj styles it's just i guess we'll see what happens from here on out well, the other thing with with the way that he lost the championship in that match is he w lost the championship because of his over arrogance. Um, he actually had Kushida beat several times, but he refused to beat him without hitting the one-winged angel. And it was eventually his last attempt at the one-winged angel where Kushida rolled him into a victory roll type cradle that cost him the championship. If he had just tried to pin him after hitting, you know, um, I think it was like a, a sit-out powerbomb and then also like he had like a spike DDT on him they made it the commentators made it clear you know he he could win the match here but he's but he is so arrogant he wants to get hit the big move to win the thing and his insistence on doing that is what cost him the championship and i think we'd be remiss in not um including in our commentary about this match that they both had great entrances kushida came out as marty mcfly with the former champion i can't think of his name at the moment but the former champion who um Omega had, had won the championship from a year prior as Doc Brown and then Omega came out as the Terminator and then actually during the match at one point the Young Bucks who had come down with him were drumming on um, garbage cans with the Terminator 2 theme um, right before Omega hit a huge flying tope onto, um, onto Kushida on the outside. Yeah. And you're right, uh, and I was going to mention that too. It's like I remember one of the worst gimmick um, entrances ever. Uh, Cena Triple H, and I, which WrestleMania was that? Was that 28? When Cena came down as a gangster and Triple H came in, in as a king, and it, pretty sure it was 23. Was it 23? I it just it might have been one of the worst gimmick entrances ever. And give credit where credit is due. NJPW Kenny Omega and uh, Kashida, Kashida, they um, they played it through. They played it through to the end. They kept that that entire feel going that you they set up in their entrance throughout the entire match. And I thought I thought that made the entrances even better because, like you said, the Young Bucks playing the Terminator 2 theme and Doc Brown getting up to uh, and uh, Matt Stryker was hilarious during this match with all of his time travel comments. I I just it was it was a very very well done match and you're right at the time when I watched it I thought this was an instant classic I thought it was one that was match of the year candidate and you were talked about the arrogance that Kenny Omega showed you know later on in the night we get that same kind of ending uh, where it's someone's arrogance that costs him the title as well um, but I, I don't know what more I can say about the Kenny Omega match uh, except for it was a fantastic match and they, they played it out really well they really did and then, and then like you were talking about earlier about power cleansers, I think the next two kind of fit that that role. We don't really need to spend a lot of time on this. It was just basically um, the uh, Bullet Club ended up losing their tag team titles. So the second straight match Bullet Club loses a championship in. Um, they lose the tag team titles, uh, Gallows and Anderson do, to Togi, Maka, Maka, Togi Makabe and Tomoaki Hanma. Um, and in a match that like a lot of unfortunately bullet clubs tag team matches to me was just a, another tag team match yeah and it didn't show what um what the 
WWE saw in Anderson Gallows to bring well to bring Gallows back. I, Anderson was he ever a WWE guy? Not to, to my I think he was was considered by a lot of people to, to not know now that of course um, Styles was signed and Sting was signed that you know Anderson was basically the and actually Styles had wrestled in WWE before although briefly. Um, I think Anderson was generally considered to be the best wrestler in the world that had never been signed to a WWE contract at all. Yeah, and, and this match did not show the reason why um, they're bringing Anderson back, or Anderson in and Gallows back. And the only thing I hope is if we get a Gallows back, we get a Jesse Festus reunion. Please, please no. can we have that. I need, no. I need to hear the biscuits you know, and gravy. I told you I was going to kill you if you ever said that again. And now, of course, you're seeing it for from you know half an hour away, so I can't. <laughs> I need I need to hear my biscuits and gravy entrance song again. I just need to, and I don't want to YouTube it. But either, either well, I, I guess I wouldn't mind if Festus returned, but I just I didn't like Jesse at all. Well, Jesse, I don't care that he's my, I don't care that he's Michael Hayes' kid. I just don't like him. He was fun. Anyway, I I just didn't show what they can do, and, and you're right. It was just another tag team match. I guess. I could see where they were going with this is they're building and building and building and their uh, Kushida Kenny Omega match was a um, a huge match and a, and a big time loss and then Anderson Gallows losing you know now you got Bullet Club with two straight losses losing their titles um, and, and in fact on the show now you've got four out of the five matches were Bullet Club in them and three of those five or four matches bullet cluster. So you, you could just see what was going on as they're there. This was their fighting back against bullet club. And I, I just didn't see what I wanted to see out of that, out, out of especially Anderson and Gallows. Sorry, I, had, I forgot to press my mute button there. Um, yeah. Um, I, I totally agree. I, and you know, if you want doc Gallows to come in as fast as and be with somebody entertaining, then there's always case Slater they could stick him with. Yeah, you could you could do that. You could bring back CM Punk and we could have this rated society again. I don't think CM Punk is ever going to wrestle for WWE ever again. Sad. Anyway, um, uh, and let's 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 move on from there. Which is like I said, it was just a tag team. I mean, it wasn't a bad match. It wasn't a good match. It was just basically a tag match. Yeah. Um, and move on to to what you actually said was kind of the. Uh, I can't remember exactly how you phrased it, but I, I took it as this kind of, you kind of meant it was kind of a match that you could have taken or, or left, which was Hiroki Goto taking on Tetsuo and Na Naito, who has had a complete turnaround in the last year or so to from being um, a big fan favorite, uh, or at least, you know, they tried to push him as a fan favorite. He never really got over big after he was out for almost a year with an injury. He came back in a couple of main event matches. They really couldn't get him over as a baby face. So he, he turned heel last year. And now he's along with um, Kota Ibushi and um, and now a guy named Evil. He's part of a stable called Los Ingo Nerlables de Japón. So I, I probably totally butchered that, but I, you know it's it's Spanish, and you know you and I don't follow um, New Japan. At least you know we haven't been as much as we would like to in the future. So um, you know we're not really that down on it, but really it was just kind of a kind of a match where you know, Naito was trying to get over as a heel. Uh, he ended up losing to to Goto, which you know doesn't really help a lot when you're trying to get over a, a big time heel, in my opinion. Um, and it just was kind of boring. But a lot of things that Naito does are just boring in general. Yeah, and I mean we don't have to spend a whole lot of time on this match. I, I thought this was the palate cleanser that we uh, that I, it just didn't fit. I mean every match is a title match except this one. It, it was just it just I don't know. It just didn't fit with me. Um, so we. We don't have to spend any more time on that. We, but I do want to spend some time on the next match for the Neverweight Championship, Ishii and Shibata. That was a five-star match. And as a match itself, you and I were talking about this. Um, these next three, you know, this one we we're hard. It was between this one and the next match. We were kind of trying to figure out which one was the better of the two. As a match itself, this was a five-star match. There was everything to like about it. The fact that they they made it feel like it was a huge fight it was there you back and forth action you know they no sold moves at perfect times and it wasn't like a hulk hogan no selling when he's hulking up this was two big guys 
in there fighting in a big fight feel and doing everything that they could to hurt the other guy. And the other guy, when he would no-sell a move, it was set up at a perfect time because it made him look tough. He was taking the best move he could, and he was able to withstand it. It just, it was, it was really, really good. And I love the fact that even after the match was over, they both laid there completely exhausted and continued to sell the, the match and how tough it was. I just, there was everything to like about this match. Yeah, um, what Jeff's talking about here is uh, the Never Open Weight Championship match. And the Never Open Weight title, I can't remember exactly what Never stands for. It's, a, it's actually an. an um, um, well, it's obviously an abbreviation, but I'm trying to think of what the word for is an abbreviation that's spoken as a word. <laughs> and I can't think of it off the top of my head. You know, me being the English major, of course I can't think of it. But anyway, it's it's basically Japan's version, New Japan's version of a tough man championship. Where it's it's almost like the hardcore title, except for the, not with um, chairs and tables and garbage cans. It's just, you know, two guys beating the liver, living hell out of each other for, you know, a championship. And in this case, it was basically a battle for, um, like I would, you know, I guess, like I said earlier, who was the toughest guy, um, Kashiori Shibata taking on Tomohiro Ishii, and Shibata had been out of the company for a while, had returned about a year ago, and was still kind of making his way up as he was as he was formerly part of the Three Musketeers with Nakamura and um, Tanahashi. So you know, it covers two huge guy, two huge names in New Japan. Both guys former Intercontinental Champions. Um, both guys former multiple-time World Champions. But Shibata had left because because he didn't want to be kind of touted as one of the three Musketeers. He wanted to come in and or he wanted to earn his spot basically. And so he takes a year or so or takes a few years off. Comes back about a year ago. And he's fighting his way up to his first singles championship. Meanwhile, standing in his way is Ishii, who is just a you know a, a, a little guy, but a, a burly guy, a tough guy, and he takes basically you know any shot you want to give him. And that's how basically this match began. Is you know one guy would sit would sit in any style on the ground, while the other guy kicked him in the back as hard as he could. And it became clear at one point that Shibata was going to win this competition because his finisher is actually a running penalty kick to the chest. And so he obviously was the guy that, that you know, could could take the most punishment in that situation. And he ended up taking the most punishment for the entire match, but it told an incredible story. Yeah. Um, they would hit each other with with clotheslines and kicks and punches and a suplex here and there. It but it really was go, go ahead. it really was an incredible story because it felt like this was a big time fight. When you saw this, it felt like Tyson Holyfield. It felt like uh, um, it it just felt like it was a huge huge deal and and two big warriors going at it and it it just everything about it I love. Um, and of course, things. Well, and and also what helped sell it. What you mentioned Matt Striker earlier. What it helped sell it was that he was so pumped even coming into the match, and you could just tell by his commentary how much he was enjoying everything. Um, Yoshitatsu was just kind of sitting back in awe, enjoying the whole thing, and both uh, Kevin Kelly and Striker kind of pointed that out during the course of the show, that he was just kind of sitting there in awe and did really couldn't say anything because he was he was just so caught up in the moment. And then, and then there was a, there was actually a spot in the match where all three guys were quiet, and and Stryker said, "That's the best commentary we've done all night." <laughs> yeah, it, it was. It, he, they did a great job uh, on commentary, and I can't say enough how well they did. And you're right, Matt Stryker sold that perfectly when he. You could tell how excited he was to see this when they were first making their entrances, um, and I, of course, thanks to Wikipedia, uh, never. The ne in the Never Open Weight Championship, Never is an acronym for the uh, for the word acronym. There you go. That's the word I was looking for. New yeah. Blood Evolution, uh, Villainity, yeah, Villainity, Eternal and Radical. Ah, so, okay, perfect. You know, and it, I mean, these two guys they fit the bill. That was what that's what we saw. We saw just something amazing um, that... Well, well, and what's most amazing about it is you, if you think about, you know, the best WWE matches we see nowadays, it's stuff like Kevin Owens taking on Dean Ambrose with, with all kinds of super moves, or Kevin Owens taking on John Cena, where Cena's hitting, you know, the Code Red, or he's hitting the, 
um, the springboard stunner, and Kevin Owens is hitting his um, package power slam or hitting the top rope fisherman's buster. This this match had none of that. It was just two guys beating the living hell out of each other. And that's yeah. and they kept us and they kept us captivated for the entire 25 minutes or so of the match. You're right, and we were about 10 minutes in, and um, I think I can't remember the the guy that was doing the color commentary that. Um, where he was silent most of the night, um, but he Top had two? said, "Yeah, he had said on there that that's the um, that's the first suplex of the match, and that was ten minutes in, and they didn't do much. They they went out there and beat each other up, and they made it look like this was this was the most important championship in the world, and they're gonna they're not gonna try and hit all these kind of power moves and and flashy moves. They're just gonna go out and punch you until you can't move anymore, so that they can win the title. I thought I just thought it was great." It, it was, and, and the part where you knew, I think where you started to feel the momentum turn was where Ishii would hit a clothesline, Shibata would hit a kick. Ishii would hit a clothesline, Shibata would hit a kick, and then eventually Ishii hit the final clothesline to knock Shibata down, but instead of being able to follow up on it, he just landed face down himself, and you know both guys were out of it for a while, and then like I said, Shibata ended up winning with that penalty kick to the chest, but, but yeah, I mean, this match is... So far, the match of the year in my in my mind. Um, Nakamura and Styles followed up with it with another tremendous match, though leading leading into this. And you see, that's what you were you just said uh, your match of the year and Ishii Shibata and I had to go back and watch these two back to back again. Um, just and I've now seen both of these matches probably a dozen times, um, trying to figure out which one I like the most. Um, Ishii Shibata was a five star match. AJ Styles Nakamura was maybe four, four and three, four and a half, four and three quarters around that range. It missed a few things. It was lacking a few things. It was a fantastic match. But the story that came into this about this being the um, only time these two have ever met and, um, you know, having everything involved in it, you know how big I am on stories coming in. To me, this. Exactly. We talked about that the other day, too. Yeah. And, and yeah. to me, that story coming in and the mutual respect they showed each other afterwards made this age, the Styles Nakamura match the match of the year so far in my mind ahead of Ishii <laughs> Shibata simply because and you, you, and you and I switched positions in about three days because because we were I, I actually had that match as my match of the year until I rewatched them yeah and, and that's the same way I had the Ishii Shibata as my match of the year because as a, as a match itself if you're just going to take one match you don't care about the story ahead behind what's going on Ishii Shibata five star might be the match of the year but when you include that story and that mutual respect that is Styles and Nakamura sh showed each other afterwards it, it, to me it's no question I, it's and it, it when we did our year end review I chose the one uh, the one match that had an incredible story coming into it and again they showed the mutual respect afterwards with the four horse women reuniting I, I just thought this AJ Styles Nakamura match was great from start to finish there was nothing about it including their entrances I, I don't know um, how AJ Styles uh, with the, the shooting of the bullet and, and Nakamura grabbing it and eating it I, it just it the they were just they were in sync this whole match and, and they proved that they are the two best wrestlers in the world well, there's just a couple of things about the match that I personally didn't like that, that upon rewatch kind of brought it down for me. Um, one of them is that, I, is that I just, I would prefer match, I prefer matches to not have so many finishers involved in them. And while I realize that that's kind of part of how New Japan does things is that finishers don't necessarily finish things. Um, when Nakamura had to hit like four or five BIAs in order to beat Styles, and then Styles, of course, hit you know the one legged Styles clash, and then ended up going for a top rope one later on, only to get um, you know in, in a th spot that I thought was uncalled for yet. I mean, I, I thought you know we were minutes away from him having to try for a top rope one, and him ended up you know going for that and of course missing it. But it it was just the attempt at it, at it that I it took me out of the moment a bit. And then of course the chicanery with Styles earlier on in the match. Well, it certainly set up a you know a bit of the story. You know, um, Ishii versus um, Shibata didn't have that. I mean, there was no chicanery involved. It was just two guys straight ahead, you know, beating each other. And so, just because just the, those few aspects of it, like you said, you know, wrestling-wise, I thought I thought took it out of it. I mean, if you include the story in there, I I I, I don't know if I can make a choice between the two of them. And you know, we've got another 
11 months to go on, go in the year, but I, I find it hard to believe that we're going to see a match that's going to top one of these two. I, 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 can't, I can't agree more. I honestly can't. <laughs> I just, I, I can't. Um, and it's the, the Ishii Shibata, I loved it. I love these both for different reasons. Um, and again, to AJ Styles, it kind of had the Kenny Omega where his ego got in the way, and so he went for that top rope Styles clash, and that's what ended up costing him. But uh, just to hear Matt Stryker scream Booyaye um, whenever Nakamura hit it, I just I hope that move comes to the WWE and we get to hear um, uh, Byron Saxton screaming that. Uh, it's just it it was a fun match. I. I'm with you. I hate the fact that, um, and you can blame Kurt Angle, Steve Austin for this because that's where it started with the kicking out of um, finishers. I, I miss the time when a finisher was a finisher. Um, but the AJ Styles Nakamura match just it played it to perfection. Um, it the match itself wasn't the five star. I mean, like I said, four and a half, four and three quarters maybe. But the story coming into it. Um, is what really pushed over the top for me. It, it really did. And, and I don't want to shortchange the main events here, so I think we're going to have to, to move on a little, a little bit. Unfortunately, we've only got about a minute left, I think. Because um, that also had a great story coming into it. I mean, this was the, I believe, the seventh time that these two guys were fighting for the world championship. And it was the fourth, the third time in four years that they were facing each other for the IWE Heavyweight Championship at the Tokyo Dome on January 4th at Wrestle Kingdom. And for the first time ever, Okada left with the championship against Tanahashi. Well, and you made me, uh, you made me watch <laughs> all seven of those. Uh, oh, I didn't make well, you. I gave you the opportunity you to do so. gave me the opportunity, and I did. And um, watching all of them, to me, this one was, I don't know, maybe the third, fourth best. It was... the they've done some work in the past that was mind-blowing um and this uh, th their their best match and maybe the best match i've ever seen is jan was january 4th 2013 yeah and that's that was the one i was going to say it was my my number one match that they've had and this just didn't live up to that hype um it was good it, it, there was a lot to it. I, I mean, I'd say maybe a four star. Um, you know, we were going to talk, and now we probably don't have time to about how Dave Meltzer uh, met or said that this was a five star match and easily the match of the night. I don't. And actually, James Caldwell of Progress and Torch said the same I, thing. I don't know what they were watching. I really don't. I don't know what story they were watching. But this wasn't even their best match, much less the match of the night. I, it, you know, exactly. It, it, I, I think, I think it's just kind of you, you talk yourself into, you know. You talk yourself into that what you're going to see as a classic, and and that you're just kind of expecting that to happen, and then and then it you know what you see you think it's a classic even if it really isn't maybe kind of thing. Yeah, and I maybe that's what they did. Just just, just like just like you talked yourself into that you're going to be disappointed with the Star Wars movie and to be disappointed even though it was uh, one of the better match better movies of the I year. I did not say I was gonna. I did. I went <laughs> in there with hope that it was going to be great, and I was just disappointed um but i was just messing with you the okada Ta tanahashi and, and you know we're out of time but the okada okada tanahashi match if you want to watch a great match between these two go back to wrestle kingdom nine uh and watch that one or was it eight or nine seven wrestle, wrestle, wrestle kingdom, wrestle kingdom seven go back and watch that one because that's a great match between these two this one was just lacking yeah i mean and i thought nine was a better match than this one too actually even though i i mean it's 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 up there um you know, nine I thought was. It's it's kind of weird. I mean, last year's show I thought it was the fourth best show, but I thought it was better match than this year, and I thought it was the third best match on this year's show. So, but but I mean, but yeah, I mean they've had at least two matches that were better than this one. Yeah, at least two. Um, I and I'd be I'd argue three. Uh, I'm gonna go back and watch some of these other ones again, but uh, you know they 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 could have done a much better job. The only thing that I can see that would push us as a five star match. Um, in the eyes of people that have been following the story the entire time of, as of course you know I have and, and you have you know thanks to my generosity <laughs> or my demanding depending, <laughs> depending on how you put it um, is, is the fact that Okada finally you know polished off the story by, by leaving with the championship for the first time I've never been one where a feel good story makes it a five star match well, exactly, and, and neither have I. I'm just saying that that may be the perspective that they're looking at. So, so folks, anyway, that you know, that's our take on Wrestle Kingdom 10. It's a great show. Go out there and find it. I'm sure it's out there on YouTube now in its entirety, because it almost always is at this point in time um, every year. But 
uh, yeah, it's it's a great show. Um, even if you watch it with Japanese commentary, I'm sure it's great. Um, but yeah, uh, I I really am am planning on in the some sometime very soon. I know I've said this for like three months, three or four months running, but I'm I'm very shortly going to be picking up New Japan World and watching as much NJPW as I can because um, at least the wrestling I I tend to enjoy it more nowadays than I do WWE. And I agree. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I, and I'm hoping that in a few weeks we'll be reviewing, we'll be able to, uh, I'll be able to get Jeff a copy of Ring of Honor's um, 14th anniversary show. We'll be able to review that for you as well. So it's not all WWE all the time, or you know, all as our as our wrestling. Company. Oh yeah, I mean we'll st- we'll work in Ring of Honor, New Japan, Lucha Underground, and you hear me talking about occasionally, and uh, um, also TNA whenever we gets brought up, but not all going to be WWE all the time. We'll mix in some other. Well, if, if they decide to not have T- Matt Hardy as their world champion in 2016, I I would start taking TNA seriously again, possibly. Well, you know, we might go back and review those Asylum years too. Yeah, that's true. We have talked about doing that, but for the for this week, I think that's all we've got. Say bye, Jeff. Bye, Jeff. <laughs> we'll try to do better next time. <laughs>